Madam President, it's been more than a year since the United States Senate passed the bipartisan U.S. Innovation and Competition Act, uh, commonly known as USICA. But it includes a, an important provision that uh, Senator Mark Warner, the senator from Virginia and I introduced more than two years ago, called the CHIPS Act, which is designed to shore up a dangerously vulnerable supply chain of high-end semiconductors from Asia to the United States. The fact is that the United States makes 0% of those advanced semiconductors that are necessary to everything from your iPhone to fifth generation joint strike fighters like the F-35. Unfortunately, after the, we passed a bipartisan bill in the Senate, the House decided to go uh, the, the partisan route and add additional unrelated pieces of their wish list. Everything from handouts to labor bosses to money for a UN climate slush fund. We were in the process of stripping out these partisan provisions through the conference committee that was appointed by the House and the Senate when Senator Schumer made a big decision. He said that Democrats were likely to bring to the floor another reckless tax and spending bill like Build Back Better, although in a different version. Our Democratic colleagues got the bright idea they wanted to revive something like the Green New Deal, increase taxes on working families, and give runaway inflation even more staying power. Well, Senator McConnell, the Republican leader and members of the Republican conference thought that was a bad idea and said that there would not be a bipartisan conference bill and a partisan reckless tax and spending spree bill. It wasn't a threat, it was just a statement of fact. There's no such thing as negotiating with our Senate colleagues on the Democratic side while they sit on the sidelines drafting partisan legislation. The provisions negotiated out of a bipartisan bill wouldn't land in the trash, they would simply be recycled through a partisan reconciliation bill. But Senator Manchin, the senator from West Virginia, put an end to that last week when he killed the bill that would increase taxes on families and small businesses and implement costly Green New Deal climate policies. In my book, that's a big win for the American people who are already facing high prices at grocery stores and at the filling station. With this reckless tax and spending spree reconciliation bill dead and buried, there's now an opening to do something that we can agree upon on a bipartisan basis. I spent the weekend talking with a number of our colleagues, both Republicans and Democrats, and I'm cautiously optimistic that we can now proceed to a vote on the USICA bill or some version of it. Based on our discussions, it sounds like the majority leader will bring a narrow bill to the floor that focuses on CHIPS funding, again, something that had been pending for now more than two years, as well as tax incentives for manufacturers. This bill will not be USICA, though, and it won't be Endless Frontiers, which was the name of the bill when it was initially introduced. And it sounds like a far cry from the Competes Act, which was the House's partisan response. Rather, from all reports, it focuses on the core issue of reshoring American semiconductor manufacturing here in the United States. With COVID-19, we became aware of a lot of supply chain vulnerabilities that I think we just frankly did not, were not aware of. And it's one thing to be aware of a supply chain for things like toys or consumer items, but it's another to be dependent on a supply chain, a foreign supply chain, for something that's critical to our way of life and our economy and our national security as advanced semiconductors. What Senator Warner and I initially proposed and what I hope we'll be voting on um, this week provides market-based incentives to close the cost gap between manufacturing overseas in places like Taiwan and doing so here in the United States. According to Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company located in Taipei, they figure it costs about 30% less 
to manufacture these high-end semiconductors in Taiwan than it does in the United States. And if we're going to get that, some of that manufacturing capacity back here to the United States to protect us against potential blockades, whether it comes from a military conflict or a pandemic or a natural disaster, we're going to have to find a way to provide incentives for those manufacturing fabrication facilities to be located here in the United States. That's what we're talking about. There is a closing window of opportunity for us to act. Secretary Raimondo, the Secretary of Commerce in the Biden administration has made clear, as have various CEOs of semiconductor companies, that if the United States does not act soon, they will have to make a business decision to locate their manufacturing facilities in other places in the world where those incentives are already provided. But it does nothing to protect the United States economy or national security to have another fab or manufacturing facility located somewhere else around the world. We need them here in the United States if we're going to protect our economy and those guard against those national security threats. So if we don't make a decision soon, and I'm talking about in the next couple of weeks, then we can kiss those manufacturing facilities goodbye. And places like Texas and Ohio, Arizona, and other states around the country that might benefit from that construction and the high paying jobs that go along with them, will see them taken to Europe or somewhere else. Well, even though the senator from West Virginia said he would not support the reckless tax and spending portion of the reconciliation bill, it's possible our colleagues will move forward with a slimmed down version of an already slimmed down reconciliation bill that would require the federal government to set a price for drugs covered by Medicare, a move which I believe will stifle innovation. Price fixing always results in scarcity meaning consumers, but particularly seniors, will have less access to choice. It would also extend Obamacare subsidies for insurance companies and prop up the struggling health care marketplace. It's clear that I oppose those provisions and the perennial effort to legislate on a partisan basis. But the truth is, Madam President, if the Democrats have 50 votes plus the vice president, they can pass it notwithstanding Republican opposition. We all understand that. But given the fact that these horrific tax increases are off the table as a result of the announcement from the uh, senior senator from West Virginia, I believe we're in a posture where we can go forward with the CHIPS funding and other related provisions, and I hope we'll be able to take action on that in the coming days. Madam President, on another matter, last week, Senator Cruz, my junior senator and friend, and I took five members of our Republican conference to McAllen, Texas, which is the Rio Grande Valley, which is the epicenter of a massive humanitarian and immigration crisis that's been going on for at least the last year and a half. McAllen is the Border Patrol's Rio Grande Valley sector, it's called, and one of the business, busiest portions of the U.S.-Mexico border when it comes to illegal migration. For example, between October and May, Rio Grande Valley sector agents logged more than 333,000 border crossings, more than any of the other 20 border patrol sectors. During the visit, our colleagues were able to see and learn what, frankly, as Texas senators, Senator, Senator, Senator Cruz and I have learned long ago about the traumatic, heart-wrenching consequences of this unabated crisis. Groups of migrants with toddlers who were lying asleep on the dirt road, practically ill from the heat and exhaustion. By the way, the temperature is routinely in excess of 100 degrees at this time of year. One mother and her seven-year-old child, the mom in tears and heartbroken having left her 10-year-old Another 10-year-old child behind in Guatemala uh, was encountered. Un unaccompanied children of seven years of age with nothing more than the clothes on their back 
a birth certificate and a family, family contact information on a piece of paper. These were the sort of things that my Senate colleagues had a chance to experience, which unfortunately I have seen all too many times before. These aren't the only heart-wrenching scenes from a war-torn country half away around the, around the world. This is happening on our front doorstep. This is happening in Texas every day. My colleagues and I also spoke with some of the folks whose home, homes and property sit along the U.S.-Texas border with Mexico. They shared with us stories about what it's like to live along one of the hot spots for illegal border crossings. One resident told us last year the Brooks County Sheriff Department recovered the bodies of 119 dead migrants. So far this year, the county has recovered 64. Just by way of explanation, the coyotes or the smugglers will bring the migrants across the border, put them in a stash house, and then when they believe the coast is clear, put them in a truck and transport them north. They'll have to go through a border checkpoint or an interior checkpoint in Foul Furious, for example, which is where Brooks County is located. But what happens is the smugglers will tell the migrants, get out of the vehicle and walk around the, the checkpoint and we'll pick you up on the north side. The problem is this is very tough terrain in over 100 degree plus temperature. And frankly, when some of the migrants become ill or injured, they're simply left behind to die. And that's why so many bodies have been recovered, for example, in Brooks County on a regular basis. It's tough to imagine the toll this sort of discovery takes on a farmer or rancher, but, and then multiply that shock by more than 100. And then we heard about the losses to property suffered because of this crisis, stolen vehicles, broken fences, damaged crops, vandalism, people who are afraid to let their own family members live and work on their own property because they're worried about the drugs, they're worried about the potential violence. They talked about the safety concerns for their families and employees because drug traffickers and human smugglers go right through their backyard. These men and women are understandably angry. They said to us, this is the United States of America and I can't let my daughter or wife or children live and play or work on our own property. They're frustrated beyond belief because their families and employees, their homes and livelihoods are in jeopardy due to the Biden administration's failed border policies. In case there are any doubts, I want to emphasize that what's happening on the border right now does not benefit anyone. Border Patrol agents and are stretched thin, they're frustrated, they're overwhelmed by everything they're expected to shoulder. They've been told they cannot do the job that they took an oath to perform under policies by the Department of Homeland Security, which can only be described as non-enforcement policies. Landowners are saddled with safety concerns and financial losses. Non-governmental organizations, which are doing their best to help people in need, are carrying the weight of this humanitarian crisis with no end in sight. Brave Texas Department of Public Safety officers and National Guardsmen are making serious sacrifices as a result of the administration's failure to secure the border. These state guardsmen and the Department of Homeland Security should not have to do a job that is the responsibility of the federal government. But when the federal government won't do its job, the state of Texas has no choice. One guardsman actually drowned while trying to save two, mi two migrants struggling to swim across the Rio Grande River. And the migrants themselves are routinely abused, exploited, even raped, and sometimes left for dead in the middle of unforgiving terrain. The only people really winning in this crisis are the criminal organizations and the human smugglers that are getting richer by the day. These cartels are transnational criminal organizations. They will, they will traffic in anything that makes them a buck. They are what one person has called commodity agnostic. 
They don't care what that commodity is. Their goal is simply to maximize their profit by whatever means necessary. And there's no question that the Biden administration's policies have helped enrich the cartels and resulted in too many migrants having lost their lives. Throughout my time in the Senate, I've had the privilege of working with countless men and women who live and work along the southern border. Their experiences and input have shed light on the scope and scale of this crisis, and I'm glad to be able to welcome some of our Senate colleagues to join us for an informative trip to the Rio Grande Valley. And I appreciate our colleagues taking the time to come visit the U.S.-Mexico border for an update on the border crisis. Of course, most of them don't come from border states, but in the memorable words of one of our colleagues, now every state is a border state because the consequences of this huge migration and humanitarian crisis, not to mention the drugs that are smuggled across the border, affect every community, every state in our nation. I also want to thank my constituents, my fellow Texans who took the time out of their busy schedule to educate our colleagues, the officers, the agents, the landowners, the National Guardsmen, the Texas Department of Public Safety officials, the local sheriffs, and others. What's so shocking to me, Madam President, is despite the complete security breakdown and really the lack of any dispute about what exactly is happening on the border, we just can't seem to get the Biden administration's attention. Landowners can tell him what it was like to discover the dead bodies of migrants who were abandoned by human smugglers. And those who do the Lord's work at non-governmental organizations can tell the tale of migrants who were violently assaulted and raped on the way to our country, and some of whom arrive pregnant. If President Biden would take a moment to sit down with these folks who live and work along the border, he may begin to learn more and to view the situation for what it really is, a humanitarian and security crisis precipitated by his administration's unwillingness to secure our border. President Biden has an open invitation to visit the Texas border, and I hope he will take us up on that. If he would, we might finally be able to get something done on a bipartisan basis to abate this crisis and to secure our open borders. Madam President, I yield the floor.